Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Kate Moss. I'm a novelist and a playwright and a biographer of CFT, as you know. And it's my huge pleasure to welcome everybody to the very first of the pre-shows for the Minerva. And in particular, uh, to welcome Michael Longhurst. Um, yes, exactly. You see, round of applause immediately at the back. Um, for who is opening the Minerva season. Uh, Michael and I recently talked on a slightly bigger stage because uh, Michael was also the uh, director of the astonishing... Uh, Amadeus that we did at the National Theatre. Um, however, having seen this extraordinary play uh, by Kushner last night, Caroline or Change, I can say that he is as much a master of the small space as you are of the big space. So welcome, Michael. Um, Thank you very much indeed. Actually, starting there, what is it like to have done something so epic at the National with a live orchestra who were also actors, Amadeus, all of that, and then come to this huge piece of work, but in a much smaller environment. How does it change how you approach it? Well, I guess, I mean, when I opened, after opening Amadeus, I did have a sort of a bit of an emotional come down because you, you sort of climb all your life to try and get to, you know, get to the National and then you do and you, you get given the resources of, of, you know, of 20 actors and opera singers and a 20 piece orchestra and you make a thing and it goes well and then you're a bit like well I don't know what I'm gonna do now um <laughs> pinnacle of absolutely career. you feel a little <laughs> bit adrift but then you know Daniel gave me a phone call and offered this and it was exactly the kind of challenge that you want I've never done a musical pro professionally before so that was very you know would, would be new and a whole new sort of skill set really um and I, I knew Kushner's work I'd heard of it but I hadn't you know I knew what it was about but I hadn't seen it so it was a really exciting new challenge. Did you know this play, or did you first see it by reading it as a text after Daniel so, had run So I, I, had, I remember reading the reviews of it in 2006. Six. 2006. <laughs> um, it and, was on at the National in 2006. And it had sort of astonishing reviews. And I, re and I remember being a play about you know, a domestic maid and a washing machine was sort of all I knew about it. <laughs> um, but I didn't know more than that. So I, I, and Daniel sent me the script first, so I read the text of it which is written in um, loose verse. And then I listened to the soundtrack of it a, a day later. And it's, it's, inc it's incredibly exciting stuff. It's very dense for a musical. It's a bit like reading Shakespeare. Um, I mean, I shouldn't, you know, confess to this because it didn't do Emma Rice very well, but when I read Shakespeare, I fall asleep because it's really hard. And then when you get actors to read Shakespeare, it's amazing and it's alive and it's a thing of beauty. And when you've been rehearsing Shakespeare for two weeks, you have no idea how it was tricky because you just get inside it. And I think the same thing is absolutely true of this musical. I mean, Janine just doesn't, doesn't give you the things a musical usually has, which is verse, chorus, repeat verse, go to the bridge, chorus. Again. It just doesn't do that. Each time there's a new psychological thought, the style of music changes. So it's, it's hugely dense and complicated. But also, when you get it right, the music teaches you what you need to do to stage it and what the characters are trying to do. And that is massive. Who has so far already seen it? I know it's only had a couple of previews. And who is going in tonight? Ex right, so we will be careful. But in ter... In ter <laughs> well, I mean, actually, he's already given away. It's about a, a maid in a washing machine. So the spoiler... Spoiler's out there. Um, but actually, when you say it's a musical, it's not really I mean, it's what we think of it. It's an opera, opera really, isn't it? Isn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah. So do you want to explain a little bit how it works and, and, and how it would be described? It's, you know, it's not well, it's kinky a, boots no, or I mean, uh, Mamma Mia, is it? Tony Kushner no. had... And I, uh, Tony, apparently, to, to take his anecdote, um, when he was deciding if he could be a playwright or not, he wrote down 12 ideas in an envelope. Um, and the only idea that he's actually ever finished is this one. Mm -hmm. um, so, and he'd wanted to write a play about um, his childhood, I guess, and um, what it was like to grow up in Louisiana as a Jew, having uh, an African-American maid who was both somehow the maid and somehow the president of the United States. So that was the brief he set himself. Um, and he couldn't write it and couldn't write it. And then he got offered an opera commission. And I think the idea of being allowed to use music when he grew up in a very musical house, both his parents are classical musicians, and um, and it's incredibly autobiographical. The um, the play, not entirely, but there's a rule in this play. Um, the stepmom comes up with a rule to help teach the child, and that is based on a rule in his his own life. 
and they had a maid who the character of Caroline is based on. Um, not everything is, you know, there's lots of invention in there, but it came from wanting to explore that. And he had an idea for 12 scenes, and they looked for a composer in Janine. They offered it to Janine, and she didn't think it was for her because she felt it was too complete. And a year later... What, what did she mean by that, do you think? I think she felt there wasn't necessarily space for her, somehow that it was a very complete text, and so she would be hampered having to write, to, to be constrained by his right, writing. So, yes, yeah, so that actually it would be very much the secondary partner rather than organic. Absolutely. Writing. And Janine and Tony worked on some commercial idea for a musical a couple of years later that was terrible so they both pulled out of it but they discovered they really liked working together and she discovered that he was a huge fan of rewriting and restructuring and thus the collaboration was born. And so was it uh, Tony Kushner's idea the sense that there would be all these different different musical styles and there would also basically be no spoken dialogue to speak of just a little bit here and there was that his idea as part of the opera do you know that or whether I don't know I know and I guess I don't know quite where the and it, because it had as an African-American maid in a Jewish family they've absolutely drawn on those two worlds of music so you watch the Motown and the gospel music and the spirituals and you can see influences of the work songs and the, you know and all of that is in there and then there's Jewish klezmer music and then there's classical music because the family are classical musicians and you sort of see in the, the musical these two worlds of music come together and swirl around each other and change each other and then by the end there's a sort of very interesting hybrid and it, and you can you can sort of hear it picked out so you the tune that Caroline hums early on gets taken up by the clarinet, which is the instrument that the father plays. And, and so you, the, yeah, it's a be- I mean, it's so intelligently thought out, which is a, a gift when you're, you know, in rehearsals. And it's the most rich psychological characters I've, I've ever seen in a musical. I mean, they're so dense, which is, you know, hugely exciting. Espe- and especially for me when I'm coming from a background of plays rather than a background of musicals, that actually you spent a lot of time in rehearsals rehearsing it like a play and speaking the lyrics like lines and not singing them and really trying to do the events and the intentions of the characters. And then while they were sort of note bashing in the other room with Nigel and then they would come back with this amazing sound. He's your musical director. Nigel Lilly's my amazing musical director who I'd met a sort of year ago. That sounds like a play in itself, note bashing with Nigel. Note bashing with Nigel. (laughs) And and, and, oh, they bashed. Um, So... You've read it, and yep. it's dense, but you, there's something you can see there. With something that is so held by this central character, I mean, the performances are astonishing across the board, but in the end, if you don't have your Caroline, mm-hmm. then where are you? Absolutely. So do you immediately start to think, right, one, I can see a way of how I would do it, but secondly, I can only do it if I can have X, Y, Z, A, B... No, is casting immediately part of you saying yes or did you say yes and then think ah! um, it was immediately part of saying yes and um, you know the list of people that I know that could have a go on this character is, is not a long list and I knew exactly who was first on my list um, and um, we hoped that, that would work and it did which is great yes um, we're but, all on the edge of our seats so <laughs> like, ah. and it did but um, I did sort of say to Daniel well you know if that can't work out then we need to not write out the possibility of going to America for this casting because, you know, the, the, the vocal requirements of the role of Caroline is huge. So um, basically I knew that Sharon was doing a musical that overlapped the entirety of my rehearsal period. So she was singing a three-hour musical in the, in the evening down the road, would come in to rehearsals the next day, sing with me through the day, would let her off an hour early so she could have one hour to herself, and then she would go and sing for three hours in the evening, which is insane. But... You know, when the time does that and the role is that and the right person, you know, you have to make it work, and we did. Because the original Caroline, I think, won a Tony. And, of course, Sharon D. Clarke well, is an Olivier. <laughs> did she not win? She, she was nominated. Oh, she didn't get it. They were nominated for a lot, was it? Yeah, some... it, was, it was nominated for be- it was nominated for Best New Musical. Uh, the girl who played Emmy originally won the Tony. Oh, right, of course. And, of course, Sharon D. Clarke has just won the Olivier for... Uh, Ma Rainey, Rainey at the National. So you're really, you know, this is, this is the top few performers at yeah. this level in the world, really, isn't absolutely, it? Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, it's, yeah, as I say, there's this idea of a boy that thinks his maid is the president of the United States. And you go, um, Sharon D. Clark for me is a pillar of president. So I was like, yes, you are a president. Please get on board. And, and, and she did. So there's 
often when um, I'm chatting on these stages to directors of musicals, the process that people were often interested in is this very intense process of casting around the mighty centre, as it were. So again, there's a lot of uh, pressure for music theatre at the moment in the UK. So how did that process of casting, is it everybody then you cast next? Or do you then cast one person and then you have to match a, a son or a wife? Or how, how does it really work in a music? I mean, I guess um, we were lucky that once, you know, once you've got Sharon attached to a project and you can quietly leak it to certain people that Caroline <laughs> is going to be played by Sharon D. Clark, then other people are very Throwing excited <laughs> to come and be part of that production. And I guess, I hope there was some interest. I'd just come off doing Amadeus. And it was, I guess, unusual, possibly, that I was doing my first musical. So that was, you know, exciting. And, and Nigel is you know, an amazing musical director and is known by a lot of musical performers to have those skills. So it felt like, the, you know, the package was there and the offer was there. And, and it hadn't been done. People had fallen in love with this musical 12 years ago and it hasn't been done in the UK since. So... Yeah. It was on... Why, why do you think that is? Because, I mean, it was done off-Broadway, on-Broadway, kind of off again. Yeah. Then it came to the Littleton... They're but incredibly strict with who they release it to. Is that what it is? It is. And, yeah. and, and, you know, and it's very hard to do because it's got an 11, 12, 11-piece orchestra, yeah. which you know, is not cheap, and Janine won't let it be done with any abridged orchestrations. So you get right. the full shebang on off at all, basically, yeah, yeah. Yeah. which means that you know, if you don't put resources behind it, you can't do it. So... Once you have got everybody together, um, how do you begin with a show like this that is both utterly naturalistic and importantly so in terms of civil rights and the position of um, African-Americans within you know, Louisiana, particularly in the South at that time, 1963, but also is surreal? So how, how, when do you introduce the surreal elements of performance and when do you say, imagine you're that woman in the room? Well, I mean, I guess I, you, you start off by doing a lot of homework and you, know, you sort of need to know the history of America from, you know, from the beginning, really, actually, because you need to know about the Civil War and you need to understand how that led to, you know, to, to, to the civil rights movement. And this play is set in one of the most, you know, astonishing years in terms of flux and change politically. It was massive. Um, so you do that sort of homework. Um, but actually, you spend, I spoke a lot to Tony about his life, and he sent me photographs from his childhood, and you try and... Because it's, it's a real privilege when, um, when a play is autobiographical, because you can really tap the playwright for any questions about the world. And astonishing stories. He came into our first week of rehearsals and shared some amazing stories that just, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're food for actors to hang on to to help them interpret it. But in terms of the sort of surreal touches... I think he realised very quickly when he was writing that if you write a play about a maid who spends her days in the basement on her own, you haven't got a lot of drama going on. <laughs> so he had to create imaginary friends for her. I mean, that's the most simple version of it. Actually, I would say the, the appliances are, you know, ancestral spirits of people, you know, who lived before her. Um, I think, you know, the wealth of America is built on the labour of black and brown bodies, and that's what this, re this represented... Mm. In, in, in the device. So while it is both, you know, fun and frivolous, it's also deeply meaningful. Um, so we sort of explored the idea that each of the... There's the radio, there's the washing machine, there's the dryer, that they're all different aspects of Caroline's psyche, um, crudely. If you divide them into chakras, one's the head, one's the heart, one's the pelvis, and she has a different relationship with each of them, and they challenge her like a Greek chorus to examine her life choices and push her towards a point of change. Do you, um, it, it's a terrible thing, and as a writer, I'm, I wince that I'm about to say this, but do you, when you were preparing to say yes, and then before, before you were committed and it became a, a real thing, were you sitting there thinking, what is it actually about? Or were you actually saying, it is Caroline's story, that's it? You know, all of the great weight of the civil rights movement and the relationship between Jewish families having maids and the African-Americans who are looking after them. Do you, do you have all of that history in your mind, and, or is it just actually uh, I, I, No, I said yes before I knew the history of civil rights, absolutely. I was completely diving off. And you're, I'm very nervous as a white director doing a play about the African-American experience. You're always... That, you get very nervous about 
your right to, to tell that story. And all you can do is do your homework and honour that as much as you can. Um, but no, actually, I just thought it's a beautiful... It's, it's so thematically rich. I mean, you know, even the title, Caroline or Change, Twelfth Night or What You Will, it's the, the sub... You know, the sub title is exactly what the play is about and there's a pun on change and it's so rich imagistically you can see it's almost sort of near a glass menagerie as a memory play mm. um so there's just a lot in there and um and i was had 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 such a good time working with music over the last couple of productions that the chance to do something with that was completely sung through was thrilling um, and you sit in auditions and people come in and they make sound and you just fall off your chair i mean you just you're just like <laughs> and you do that for week after week. Um, and, you know, and then you get a bit like, oh, well, I've seen amazing singers now, so can you act? And, and so Nigel sort of sits at that end going, no, nope, they're not good enough for singing-wise. No, nope. then I'm like, they're such good actors. <laughs> and then gradually you sort of do this. And you just, you know, and I, I'm so grateful to him sort of just having complete clarity about the t- level of singing required to deliver this complex score. So, it's so hard. So hard. So, 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 he would, so someone would come in and do something amazing, and I'd be like, oh. he'd be like, no, pitchy, or no, can't hit that note. And I'd be like, ah. Oh. You know, and then there'd be someone who could sing brilliantly, and I'd be like, nothing's going on up here, so no. <laughs> but, and together we whittled to find our amazing cast, which is, you know, really exciting. And how much of the dance choreography, as it were, I mean, not, there are not numbers in quite the same way, but how much of that is written into the text and how much is what you and Nigel and the choreographer all put together? So uh, my choreographer is Anne Yee, and um, none of it's written in. I mean, you, you, what you get is something that looks like a verse play. Right. So there's nothing. So I sort of knew that it wasn't going to be a five, six, seven, eight job. You know, you, yeah, can, yeah, you, yeah. you, you listen to the album, yes. you go, well... Teeth and smiles. Te- it's it's, it's not teeth and smiles, and it's not going to be squares on the floor and high kicks. But you want someone... But also you want to be able to give a varied evening of experience. So I... Um, reached out to Anne, who who's, um, I'd worked with a long time ago, and she'd been busy on Broadway doing Sunday in the Park and various things, and actually lives in the States now, but I managed to persuade sneak her back, back. Out, sneak her back for this, because she does beautiful, delicate work, but she can also work as a movement director, and, you know, it's usually all her work comes from psychology. So we sit and we look at the text, and we say, what is the action of your character? I'm berating you, or I'm empowering you, or I'm cheering you. So, because, you know, there's a sort of supremes style girl group in it, but we didn't just want cliched Supremes movement. We were going, so if you're empowering, then show me a gesture that does that, and we would explore and develop all the choreography from psychological intentions, which is, I think, really exciting, and it means, you know, the line between over-illustrative as a gesture and um, trying to make sure you're always supporting, conveying the meaning of the text, without sort of crude illustration. It's a really interesting sort of line to mine. So what are the differences between directing a musical, your first one, and a play? Or is it not quite as different as you thought? No, it is different, actually. I mean, this is sort of as near to a play, I think, as you can get because of the richness of character and because it's so varied. And And because there isn't that moment when characters burst into song, they are just in song. It's a bit like speaking verse. There's not a moment when you go, and now. So, you know, they're always doing that. Um, I think what has been interesting to me is when I direct plays, I am about trying to feed and provoke the actors to find a truth and very spontaneous and live thing on stage. So you will rehearse a scene and it's all about the connection and affecting the other person and changing them. But actually, I don't really block my plays until very late on. I let them play, I let them, you know, and I throw in sort of, you know, provocations and rerun it with a different idea in mind and that makes something that's very I I guess I would say my quite wet clay as it were it's not set at all and while the shows have shape they have quite a lot of movement to them Um, but the musical you can't do that I have gained such an enormous respect over this process for the skill of making something that is rehearsed within an inch of its life look fresh yeah. From, because if you don't move the chair on the right line, you are pushing against what the music is telling you. Like, you can't... The rhythm and the flow of the piece is so much more dictated by the composer's wishes that you need to really respect those and find a way to create a fresh performance within those parameters. They just feel tighter. It, for me, it's like doing Shakespeare, actually. Yeah. You know, or playing jazz. There's a score there, and you can bend it, but you've got to play the score. Whereas a play, I think... 
there is more space and therefore the performances actors don't necessarily have the same discipline. I'd say there's a real discipline to what these people do. And there's a real a process to um, protecting your instrument and delivering your instrument so that you can use it and how you rehearse and conserve that. Do you think your experience of, um, you know, for those of you who didn't see Michael's um, production of Amadeus at the National, the thing that was, well, of the many things that was <laughs> astonishing, uh, was that the orchestra was not on stage in an old-fashioned way, they were movement actors as well. So I have never seen someone play beautifully the violin lying on their back. Um, and so they were actually part of it. They were fluid and you had them in from the beginning. Do you think that that made it more possible for you to do this? Do you think that you brought some of that in or was it utterly different, the voices instrument as opposed to a fiddle or a viola or something? Um. I think it just gave me a hunger to play with music. I think what music can do emotionally is so exciting. So that, that was the draw. Um, certainly, I was more interested in the radio as a Greek chorus rather than the Supremes group, yes. which came, you know, and, and the orchestra was sort of used to the Greek chorus and Amadeus. So there was just a... That felt very exciting. Um, and just, you know, learning to embrace an orchestra, the idea that you wouldn't have them with you in the space... You know, because together we share the story. So that, yeah, it was... One of those. Yeah. And it, it is an astonishing cast you've all put together. I mean, just, you know, there, there isn't a single person who isn't exceptional. So it would be awful to pick anybody out, so I, I won't. But I will mention that you also have some astonishing young performers. And all of, you know, particularly the, the young son of the family, the Tony Kushner's memory of himself... Um, that's a huge role yeah. also. So presumably that was a very large part of um, how you put the play together. So how do you work with children when you've got very few when it's just the children? Uh, yeah, you I know, mean, oh, it's do hard. I, I don't yeah. ever done it. Oh. I mean, we were very lucky with the cast. We had, a, we had a casting director and a children's casting director and she put some amazing people in front of me, actually. Because the, the stories are that you audition forever and ever and ever and ever. And actually, finding people with the experience and the vocal ability, the pool, I don't know. She was able to put, you know, I did, um, I don't know, I maybe saw 30 Noahs and 30 Jackie and Joes. Yeah. So, but that's it. it, it and, and they were in there. And then, you know, Nigel, uh, the MD, has been the MD on Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. So he's hugely skilled with working with young yeah, children. So he, so he knows He's how, got their numbers. <laughs> he does, and he knows what they need and how to, how to teach them to sing. It was all very new for me, and I, I mean, oh, God. If I did it again, I'd be wiser. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, you know, it's very exciting. You just have to, well, you have to, in some sense, dig into it in the same way, but also really help make sure that the beats of the story are as clear as they can be. And you have to do everything twice. And you have to <laughs> remember if you change it with one team to change it with the other team and all of that sort yeah. of, you know. Yes, because you have different teams of children. They can't... I mean, it was quite funny. Some of you will know that uh, before I saw Caroline or Change last night, I was interviewing Alan Bennett. Yeah. Um, and so I'd been reading up on that and had been reading Nicholas Heitner's books on Alan Bennett. And the stories that he tells about the History Boys, where all the way through Alan Bennett was saying... Well I, well, I want children whose voices haven't broken. And Nick Heitner was saying, there are no children available. We can't find any to audition. So we'd be putting grown-ups in front of him. And I thought, and then I came and saw, you know, yours. And, of course, we have over the way. So there's that change in child actors of I think, quality. And I think there's also the part has been written really cleverly. You know, it's written in a way that someone of that age... And, you know, we found kids that look a lot younger than they actually are, which is always of what course, you do. Of course, yes. Of course. Um, yeah. So they can bring a sort of psychological Playing maturity. Playing three to ten. Indeed. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, um, but it's been written in a way that I think, you know, you know there are some really well-written Shakespeare children, actually, like Mamilius in The Winter's Tale is a brilliantly written child. And if you write something... If you write with a child well in mind, then it can be amazing to watch them push a plot forward and... You know, they both really do. And a, a, a final thing before I, I throw it out for some questions. You mentioned it about um, the sensitivity, rightly there is, about diversity and who has the right to tell a story and you as a, a white English director and you know, all of this. How do you negotiate some of the things that are about making sure within a story like this that there's never a pandering to a stereotype or an idea of what... Jewish music would be or that you know all of that how do you 
um, investigate those to make sure they're as true as you have succeeded in doing? Because it is a, a sensitive thing, presumably. It really is. Um, I think you try and do your homework. You read as much as you can. Well, your first question, can I, can I bring something to this story? You know, in the same way, you know, I mean... Marion Elliott has just delivered Angels in America. And I would be like, I'm a gay man. I'd love to direct that play. Yeah, yeah. Oh. <laughs> well, you know, but and she's smashed out of the park. Of course she yeah, has, yeah. because she's a brilliant director. And, yeah. you know, I've directed plays about climate change and Jacobean England. And I'm not a, you know, scientist. And I'm not a, you know, you just have to bring yourself to it. But I did do things like make sure that I had, you know, in a play or a musical with a, a female protagonist, I always like to have a very... F- you know, strong female-led creative team as well. So my designer is female, my choreographer is female, so that so that you are bringing that experience. Um, and then I think I've been I've been lucky to direct a number of plays with um, black actors in them. I you know I did this, a season in the Congo, uh, called a, a play called I Drink It in the Congo. And and you just you have to listen to your cast and you have to check yourself and you have to make sure that you are. You just have to be very conscious of your staging choices and, and you have to listen to your cast and check that you're both honouring the history of these people and honouring the representation of, the, of, 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 of black actors now. But also the play is, you know, 40% of the characters are Jewish and I'm not Jewish either. So you're doing all your homework there. I was you know, <laughs> reading up about my menorahs, my, you know, and how you know, Hanukkah is celebrated and all that sort of stuff. So... Um, and actually I have a, 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 a sneaky final question before I go to the audience. Um, one of the things that is very interesting with 40 Years On Across the Road is Alan Bennett's first play, 1968. It was written then, even though it goes you know, from 1900 to 1940. It's a, you know, it's a, a time-shifting clock of a play. You know? um, but obviously, world events have made it bizarrely, horribly accurate in some respects. Now, what I felt was wonderful about your direction of this is it felt Absolutely, that this was November to December 1963. Did you have any part of you tapping you on the shoulder going, should I be putting anything from outside into this or should I just let it speak as it is? Totally. I mean, this musical and, you know, when it was, it's been, it, it's been performed in Obama's home state and it's been a poem performed when we had a black president and a play about change and progress would have been thrilling to be seen in that context. And then when I was accepted the job, there is a, there's a documentary called The 13th, about the 13th Amendment, which basically is a brilliant documentary. I couldn't recommend it more thoroughly. It is about how the 13th Amendment has sort of enshrined in law the ability to kind of enslave... I mean, the penal system in America is so disproportionately full of African-Americans and the charge systems that incarcerate them are deeply unfair, and it's a profit-making system. And the penal system in America basically profiteers from African-American um, prisoners. And there's a clip in that when there, there, there is um, footage from Albany, Georgia, of you know, white racists pushing a, a black man down the street, and they've intercut it with footage that is almost identical from a Trump rally. And you just look at that and go... You know, and Tony talks about change being fast and slow and not always forward. And to be doing this story at a moment we feel right now, it's so important to show people where we were 40 years ago, or nearly 50 years ago, and look what's happening. And, and so it's a real... It's, it feels really important to be telling this story right now. And, and yes, as a director, you sit there and go, how, how much do you um, let the play speak? Because the play already is a, dom- a very domestic story. You know, it's not... The, the civil rights is the backdrop, but it's not... It's, it's, it's the backdrop, definitely. It's not front and centre. It's a domestic story set in a house about a maid and a little boy. Um, so, you, again, you're like, what do I need to do to, do to bring the story to an English audience? Um, and, of course, you sort of go, oh, the Trump... How, how can I... And you just have to sort of, I feel, don't underline the play don't don't be tempted but like you this set is based on the designer's idea for it was the trump wall this set is based on the trump wall and about what you know so um, of course you look at that you'll never know that but that we did start absolutely on a process of doing that you know and at one point this wall was going to be a wall of washing machines and you know you just go what are the where are we at and and so i hope it's in there and i hope i've resisted the chance to underline and spell it out i thought i thought that was absolutely brilliant that you hadn't actually yeah. because 
particularly, dare I say it, Chichester audiences, they get it. You know, you, you don't need when, to be When you know when you're the making theatre for a hugely, yeah. you know, theatre literate audience, you can, you know, yeah. let you know, the work speak. So. Right, lights up, please, a bit. Um, Elspeth has got a microphone. Anybody who would like to ask a question can put their hand up and Elspeth will give you the microphone. Thank you. This may sound very ignorant. I haven't come across Tony Kushner before. Did he wrote the script and the music? No, he, he wrote... Because the, that's not very usual with musicals. No, he, he, yeah, he wrote the book, um, the book, the book and Janine Tesori wrote, was the composer. And she... Uh, she won the Tony for uh, Twelfth Night that, in fact, Lauren, who plays Rose, was in, which was about 10, 12 years ago. Oh, no, that was the first one. She just won the Tony for Fun Home, which is coming to the Young Vic next year. Um, but she's written things as diverse as Shrek the Musical. So when you, when you watch tonight, just bear in mind that this composer also wrote Shrek. <laughs> I mean, that's all I'm going to say. Gentlemen there, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I, I saw the play on... Um, Monday, and I thought it was absolutely superb and really enjoyed it. But I left be, being rather hung up on the title. And you've already alluded to the sort of pun in the title about the change and so on. And without ruining it for other people who haven't seen it yet, I, I left thinking it should be Caroline and change. But it's clearly Caroline or change. Do you want to say something Interesting. about Interesting. Mm. Did you ask Tony about it? No. I mean, that's a mm, <laughs> fabulous... Great. <laughs> no, I mean, I guess I sort of thought, is it... Um, I presumed it, I took it from the or being like Twelfth Night or What You Will. So the play could be called Twelfth Night or it could be What You Will. So this play could be called Caroline or it could oh, be change. The play oh. could just be called change. That, so, that's so, 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 very so, convincing. That, that, Who knows that's if that's my... <laughs> and there are many different types of change in the play. And, you know, the play is about Caroline's uh, exp- uh, resistance to and difficulty with change. So, um, yeah. but yeah, that, that was my, that was my um, justification for the awe. <laughs> Gentlemen up the top. I just wanted to ask you, where were you when Kennedy died? When, <laughs> when Kennedy died, I was minus 15. <laughs> However, something. I wasn't. But I won't be offended you didn't ask that. <laughs> but um, but t- Tony Kushner remembers... Um, he remembers being in school and he told us he was drawing a rainbow in school when the news came and he told us... No, let me get this right. I was mixing my stories. He, uh, he, he was in school drawing a picture of a rainbow and they were all told over the tannoy and then the girl next to him had told him that he couldn't have a rainbow on such a sad day so he had to colour it brown. So that was a story from... That's so amazing, actually. An amazing story. And, you know, you see that in Noah. But he also told us what happened when Martin Luther King died in America, that actually the black students were kept in the gymnasiums because they thought there would be a riot about it, which is shocking. And, but his memory is also of his, his maid, Maudie, whose picture is in the programme, and he watched her you know, watching her weep at the news that the president had been assassinated. And the play explores, you know, JFK's legacy and how forward or not he was in terms of pushing, progressing civil rights. Because, I mean, the Civil Rights Bill was passed, um, I guess, posthumously by the following president because he had brought it up mm. and had been assassinated for his attempts to, um, to, to make this kind of change. And the South was really resisting all attempts at desegregation. Um, and it is powerful in the play that it's coming from both sides. Yeah. No, Caroline doesn't want yeah, to... Yeah, no, there's a real... There's a real compa- I mean, well, you know, um, Caroline uh, is, a, is different generationally. So Caroline is of the generation that would refer to herself as a coloured or a Negro, whereas Emmy uses the phrase black. And that, uh, you know, foreshadows the black power movement. But uh, Caroline is shocked by that. Yeah, she fa- she's offended. Absolutely. Oh, right, because, yeah. but, you know, because terms like uh, Negro uh, had been rejected by the next generation because it was uh, an enforced term from slavery. Could, could you say something about this space? The Minerva is such a, an intimate uh, theatre. that we, And we've se- we have seen many musicals that, uh, that worked here. But uh, this, this to me sounds like uh, a champagne squeezed into a bottle in this tiny space. And I wonder how difficult it is for you to work with these constraints with something that feels like it ought to be in a, a much bigger arena. 
but it's pressed into this, this small area. Well, two things I know. I heard, this might be a lie, but the, st- the playing space of this theatre is the same size as the playing space of that theatre. That's a lie. Is that a lie? <laughs> is that a lie? You haven't been in there, have no, you? No, no, but... No, no. but are you... <laughs> the, the playing... No? Well, is it... That is 40... I'm not going to say, because I always get the numbers wrong. No, uh, we'll go over there. We'll go over. We'll take yeah, over. Um, I mean, th- this is a much bigger playing space than people think. That's yeah. absolutely I mean, you, right. can, you can fit the full cast of 14 on there if you want to, but yeah. a, a 10-year-old boy can also hold it on his own. And actually, I mean, actually, yes. I mean, what's been wonderful is the response to, to see this um, piece, and that suggests that we could have sold out a space bigger many times over. But it is a very delicate domestic story, actually hugely delicate. You know, the plot centres around a boy leaving some loose change in his pockets. It's as delicate as that. So it's a privilege to be able to tell this story in this environment. It doesn't feel like a constraint at all, actually. It feels like a real luxury. And there might be, presumably, um, given it is a woman who spends most of her life underground in a basement with the laundry, if you were trying to have the washing machine there and the dryer over there and the radio over there, it she wouldn't feel confined. Well, when I, f- when I first... Yeah. yeah, I mean, absolutely, you get this sense of confinement. And when you first direct in the thrust, you have this moment where you sort of resist the thrust because you know that there has to be a fluidity to stuff. Mm. Um, but actually, the, the scene that there are 14, 15 different locations in the place, so you can't stage it naturalistically. And there are at least sort of three levels. There's the basement, the ground floor, and the first floor, and you can't fit that here. So, excuse me, the play... Um, the space forces you to take a less literal approach, which actually, given we have, you know, washing machines played by people, is a very helpful uh, put steer. The, the, the space encourages you to help these scenes flow on and then to dissolve them and to use only as much as you need to capture the essence of a scene. I mean, you, you, know, you can't build a f- complete basement and build a complete dining room and build a bus stop and build Caroline's house and build the bus journey home and build and build and... You know, you have to take that imaginative step and, and the space forces you to do that. And in fact, I mean, many of um, us old die-hard chai people will have seen musicals that have been wonderful here when they have been put in the bigger space. Have, they've been like bits of blue tack. They've just... They've stretched a bit much. It, yeah. Is there a final question... Um, for Michael. Lady in the front row, thank you very much. Just a quick one. Um, I know you're an experienced director. Did you ever perform? Oof. Um, so I performed at school. I was uh, Jesus and Godspell. I was Joseph in the Amazing Technical Dreamcoat. Um, so I, you can sing that? Hmm. Well, <laughs> just at school. Nigel will tell you not. <laughs> Very strongly. Um, and then I went to university, thought, I went to Nottingham University and did a philosophy, but there was a student theatre group, and I thought that I would do some acting there. Um, so I went to go and audition, and I was cast as fifth Spearman in a production of Dr. <laughs> Faustus. And I was, I was like, why is this? I, I, uh, and then I learned I can't act. So I had just, <laughs> I, I, mean, I just can't. Um, I can't sit truthfully inside my head and play an objective. I'm on the outside, and therefore it's self-conscious and very hammy. So I, and I was surrounded by, you know, I was at university with Ruth Wilson, so I was watching her give astonishing performances, and that was very clear that this was not my thing. But I pitched to direct uh, Peter, one of Peter, Peter Shaftesbury called Equus, but, um, and I'd nearly gone to art school, I'd been done art A level, so I was very interested in design, so I, ha- I had a go at directing, and I made the set, and I painted it, and, and then I had that moment in rehearsals when you give a good actor a good note, and something astonishing happens, much better than you can imagine and certainly better than I could ever represent. You can just sort of take someone who's doing a performance, drop an idea in, and they go... Pfft. And I was like, this is really exciting. Yeah, yeah. And, and I got hooked from that moment. And then also the moment when you sit in an audience and watch an audience around you, and if you get it right, the audience leans in, or they listen, or they laugh, or they stop coughing, or something. <laughs> something happens, and there's a moment of electricity, and that was the, the hook. And so I did uh, the Edinburgh Festival, and then student plays and then I, w- uh, I worked in the city for a year to save up and went to drama school to train as a director and then I bounced around the fringe in London being a you know, trainee slave manager for anyone that would have me and just kept doing this really and, um, and eventually you know Turned out all right. Pop theatre became... <laughs> yeah, it went, it, it went OK, which is lovely. So, yeah, I'm very... Yeah. Well, thank you. That was a lovely last question actually. Um, so, those of you who are going to see it tonight or later in the run 
you have an absolute treat uh, in store. And as you know, you cannot get a ticket for love nor money, which is what all the management like, and I think directors really like. Um, but I think we all just wish you and your amazing company the very best press night possible. It's tomorrow night, um, and we will all we are just all very proud that a show like this that has rarely been done in the UK that you have brought it down here to do for us. So, ladies and gentlemen, Michael Longhurst.